So thanks everyone for joining. This is the HFI Tech Lunch for February 16th. And today's topic is, uh, again, biomass carbonization, but I'm gonna present a few more recent advances. We're gonna talk about one we talked about last time, but in a little more detail. And then a couple of uh, newer designs. I think they're relevant. Um, and we're going to try to talk through their kind of theory of operation and some advantages and disadvantages. So our goal today, we don't have too much other than uh, just looking at these few um, uh, relatively new. I guess, you know, some of these have been around for a bit, but um, yeah, I think the more I did research on this recently, there's so many people coming up with you know so many different designs it's really hard to um i think catalog these somebody it's a it's a nice project for someone to work on eventually is you know going through youtube especially if there's so many on youtube that are uh people have been constructing and and making videos for um that it would be good to catalog those it's hard to tell you know most of the designs that you see are are focused on carbonizing wood. So like for Beatrice, I think that, you know, some of these might be helpful, but for others who are using uh, ag waste or residues or urban waste, a lot of the designs I feel like aren't very suitable because they need that bigger um, size of biomass and maybe something denser uh, like wood to operate correctly. So. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll present at least two of these are definitely suitable for a wide range of feedstocks. And then one um, probably has some variations that could work, but uh, is more suitable for wood. Uh, so the one that I'll talk about first is, again, the T-load carbonizer. I think we talked briefly about this before, but I keep coming back to this. It's a, a relatively simple design. Um, and the one that I'm showing here is uh, is from the group in Cambodia, uh, Khmer Green Charcoal, because uh, they've kind of, I feel like they've kind of perfected this pretty nicely. Um, and also the capture of the heat, which we don't see in this picture, but you can kind of see uh, along the side there how they capture the heat. But I'm a, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of these tea luds. It's so we, Last time we talked about the drum kiln and we briefly talked about T-LUD. I'll talk about here in a sec what T-LUD means again, but um, the char yield's relatively good. And in, in large part, the reason for that is the drum is insulated. So here we're actually looking at uh, just some, some um, iron sheet, some weaker iron sheet that holds the insulation against the inner drum. Um, so actually what, what's nice is you could build the inside out of, uh, different materials. You could even, I think, make it out of a brick, um, or, you know, metal, other things. So, uh, it's a little bit flexible in terms of what it can be constructed from. It's generally run as I call it, it's a batch operation. So we talked about that before you load it, you fire it. And then in this case, actually, the char ends up down at the bottom at the very end. Um, but the way that these guys operate it is, I would call it semi-continuous. So because in this factory, they run multiple kilns at any given time, one is firing while another one is being loaded. Um, so you have kind of one ready to fire as soon as one is done. So it's kind of a nice sequence that they've designed. And at, at Khmer Green Charcoal, I can talk more about this in the future, but they've made a lot of infrastructure to allow the operators to easily you know, move these around, uh, locate them underneath the drying duct. Um, so they actually use the heat to dry the briquettes. But obviously you can produce a lot of heat. Um, and in most cases, you know, I mean, even when I do drum carbonization, that's all wasted, right? We don't have a way to, to capture that. So 
I think there's provision for capturing. It takes some effort and some design and obviously some amount of money to do that. But um, we even visited a, a charcoal maker in the US recently who has found a nice way to attach the um, hot water or something like that on top of the drum. Um, so you could actually capture a little bit of the heat that way. Uh, the tea lead is nice because it can actually handle a range of feedstocks. It can't go to the very small size. I, don't, I, I didn't find cases where uh, it's worked with rice husk or sawdust, for example. But certainly, um, yeah, coconut shells in this case, but uh, small pieces of wood and twigs. Um, I think uh, groundnut shells could also work, macadamia nut could also work. The thing that will change for each of these would be the time. So the time to fire, I think we all are familiar with that. And then again, you can recover heat by um, providing some provision over the top of the drum. Or if you have a way that you could somehow drop the drum maybe down a small ramp or you know inside a kind of a hole and then have something over the top of that, at least while it's firing. Um, so RT, I think, actually is technically a T-LUT. I added that. Uh, that's the uh, design that came out of India and Tanzania. And um, yeah, I think. There's, there's operates like a T lead. The D lab drum kiln does not. And so here's a brief explanation about the T lead sort of theory of operation. So the drum we have is insulated. So that's a key to an efficient T lead, at least. Um, so insulation can be a variety of things. Uh, in the case of Khmer green charcoal, they use the ceramic wool. I think it's ceramic wool or fiberglass around the inner drum. So actually, yeah, there's a wall on the inside and then a wall on the outside. Um, so, oops, I went a little bit too fast. So then there's a grate at the bottom um, and that's important. So we need the grate to allow oxygen in so that we feed our, our pyrolysis zone. So the the kiln is lit from the top. You're probably familiar with this. Um, over time, the pyrolysis zone moves down. So that's why it top lit. And then the updraft comes because you have air coming in through the bottom. So you can imagine that as the pyrolysis occurs, you produce a bunch of gases that come up here. And if you have the right mix and they interact well with the air, you can produce a flame. Um, so that rising of gases upwards actually sucks in air uh, here. And so that helps to um, drive the pyrolysis because the pyrolysis would need a little bit of heat and you need a little bit of combustion to make that happen. And you may also get excess air that comes up and then mixes with those pyrolysis gases, which then makes the flame at the top of the kiln. Um, but you don't need very much air. So like at KGC, these, this grate is very, very small. Like the holes are very small. Um, and actually they found, you know, adding a, a bin on the bottom limits the air even further. So if you remember the picture before, they have a bin below and just the small cracks around the bin uh, that allow a little bit of air in are enough. So we don't want too much air because then again, we'll over fire the char. It'll end up having too much ash. Um, another thing that helps is a short chimney on the top. Could be a long chimney, but a short chimney, again, to pull in a little bit of, a little bit more air and flow, especially to generate that flame. And it doesn't, interesting thing here is it doesn't need to be a tight fitting chimney. Um, it actually is better if it has some gap here. So it sucks in some air from around the top of the drum. That air mixes with the gases and, and ignites inside the chimney uh, to form a flame. 
and I don't know why it's kind of cutting off here, but um, yeah, uh, means of heat recovery is also important. Um, as we're losing about 50% of the energy of the raw material uh, just as heat loss, right? So it's great to have a flame that's much cleaner. The emissions are much better from a even a local environment and health perspective, but the, for the overall climate, global climate, um, firing the emissions, flaring the uh, gases is much better. And then recovering that heat as much as possible. Um, I think across all of these designs, that's something we should really strive for, but it is, you know, it does require some infrastructure to do that. So we have to be, we have to think a little creatively and I'm, I'm interested in your ideas too about that. So that, I think that's all I have for the T-LUD, but this kind of gives you a sense. Again, lighting from the top, so top lit and then up draft. So gases and air flowing up through the bed of biomass or feedstock. So T-LUD, that's where that comes from. So that class of designs is pretty common. Maybe in some cases, it's not an insulated drum. It could be made out of brick. It could be made out of steel. Um, the grate could just be some hole, some small holes in the bottom of the drum. Doesn't need to be a separate piece. And actually this char bin isn't really necessary either, but um, for example, in, in the KGC design in Cambodia, the grate is removable. So actually the operator can slide the grate out after the uh, carbonization is complete, then all the char falls into this bin. So that makes it a little bit convenient to remove. Um, and so that some of that is documented nicely. I, I have a link at the end in um, the KGC handbook. So the other one we talked about briefly, I think, uh, during the last call, but I wanted to go back over this one as well. So the retort carbonizers. And in particular, I think some of you are familiar with uh, the atom retort. So that's what we're showing here. It does do heat recovery from the gases, like the, like the T-LUD, if you add the piece on the top to capture the, the heat from the flame. Um, retort, by definition, is a mechanism for capturing uh, heat from the pyrolysis gases, so firing those. It wouldn't generally capture other things, so you wouldn't really be condensing like some of the tars and oils if you wanted to make liquid smoke. Liquid smoke. Um, but again, you know, we, we lose 50% of the energy approximately uh, from the raw material when we carbonize, um, lost as as smoke. Uh, so I think it's important to just start thinking about that. These can be made out of steel. They can be made, made out of brick. Oftentimes it's a combination of the two because you need a cover on the top. Um, and it's hard to make that out of concrete or, or brick or stone. Um, so I'll show at least uh, a very simple uh, atom retort diagram. Um, I don't, I don't have the plans for that, so I don't know the full details. So Adam claims about 35% yield with wood. Um, other reports were a little bit lower and other retorts are lower. I've tried to do some retort experiments. It doesn't always work very well. I think one of the keys is the feedstock needs to be pretty dry. So if you have feedstock that's too wet, you're just going to burn a lot of uh, wood getting it started um, works best with large feedstock. The main reason is because we add all of that material into this big bin. It needs to keep a lot of air space between uh, the pieces of biomass. And the main reason for that is we need all of the moisture and the volatile gases, the pyrolysis gases to easily flow through. Um, and if we have a densely packed feedstock, it doesn't work that well. They're real, I would say low cost. I mean, they're not that, they're not as cheap as a drum kiln or a, an earthen kiln, but um, I think 
uh, Dr. Adam, who makes this kiln, says these are around 1,000 USD. Um, so that'd be what, about 100,000 Kenyan shillings. A little bit more than that, I think. But it's uh, relatively low cost compared to some other designs. The tea lud is also um, uh, not so expensive. Um, and then, yeah, so there's a couple of examples. Adam Retort is, I think, pretty well known. It's been, um, it's in Kenya, I'm sure, and, and quite a few other African countries, Southeast Asia. Um, it's, it's made its way around. It is, uh, it's, it's not an open source design. So uh, the design, the drawings for that come at a fee. I think some of our members have that in our group. Um, but I, I don't think we're supposed to share it. I've, I actually haven't seen it, so I haven't purchased it yet. Uh, but maybe I'll do that at some point. So here's a kind of basic operating principle for um, the Atom Retour kiln. So you have your, your bin or your bed of material that's in the main chamber. And then you have a couple of chimneys. Um, as far as I can tell, these are just redundant. So you can get easily get flow out of the chamber on both sides, on both ends. So the way that the, the atom retort at least works is there's two phases. So you have phase one is drying. And in order to initiate the drying and get the carbonization started, we have to add in some fuel. So there's a firebox here. And basically, firebox allows for us to put in some sticks or some waste. It's got to be dry. Um, we've already loaded this. There's a cover over the top. The chimneys are both open in phase one. So we start a small fire here, and the heat from that is actually sucked in through the bed and the chimneys play an important role there. The chimneys actually act as a way to pull in flow. So because they have uh, some height and especially as they start to generate some heat, they'll sort of act like a vacuum and they'll suck in flow through this firebox. So it appeared uh, through the reading that I did that the this period of drying can take anywhere from a half hour to a couple of hours, depending in part on how big the biomass is and how moist it is going in. Uh, so if it's a little bit more moist, then it seemed like we would just need to burn more of this ignition fuel. If it was less moist, we need less of that in less time. So our feedstock, the chimneys, and during phase one, we mostly have moisture coming out. And so it's up to the operator actually to know when we're finishing phase one, when the biomass is dry. And usually they do that based on a color change in the smoke. I think we're all familiar with that. So it changes from like the fluffy white, you know, billowing uh, smoke, which is mostly moisture, shifting over to more kind of yellow brown volatile gases. And at that point, actually, the chimneys get sealed. Um, Again, as far, as far as I know, that it's not detailed very well on the internet intentionally, but um, so the chimneys are sealed. And then by this time, um, the carbonization has started uh, because this chamber is you know, somewhat insulated, either in brick construction or double walled brick, I think is the actual design where you have an airspace in between the walls. Um, then, it, it more or less goes on without it needing any air to come in, no more combustion uh, externally. So the gases now are forced into the firebox where before we had ignition fuel. And instead of uh, using an external fuel like wood, now we're just burning the pyrolysis gases. So as soon as they enter that firebox, they mix with a little bit of air, we remember the fire triangle we need fuel we need air and we need ignition source so you already had a small fire there that's our ignition source the gases are the fuel and the air is coming in um and 
So that amount of fire actually produces some heat to keep everything going. So it's kind of a self-sustaining process at this point uh, during phase two. So the chimneys are sealed. None of the gases can exit out of that. And that's important actually, because if the gases were allowed to exit out of the chimneys, it would mean that we would pull air in through the firebox unless we sealed that also. But um, the idea is no air goes inside, right? So that's a basic kind of overview of the, the retort design. There's some other designs, you know, you have drum inside a drum, a small drum, drum and a big drum. Um, you have the inner drum kind of acting like this bed. This is uh, uh, the raw biomass and then the outer drum is a place for the volatile gases to burn. Um, that seems to work in some cases. I've actually tried that a couple of times and with not the best success. So I think especially with things that I try to carbonize like nutshells, it doesn't always work very well. Um, and when things are a bit moist. So these are pretty sensitive to moisture. And the more we have to burn during phase one, this ignition fuel, kind of the lower the efficiency of the overall process, right? So the, the more we can minimize that, the better. Okay, so the last one I'm gonna talk about is uh, a design called the rotary hearth kiln. And I think this is, I haven't really seen this in operation in very many places, um, but there's some interest in it. And there's one company in particular that's serving uh, some briquetters, especially the one I, the one that I know of is Carbon Roots International in Haiti is now using this design. Um, so again, they have heat. So the picture here shows a lot of pieces. The kiln itself is actually a relatively small piece uh, there. And I'll, I'll show a small diagram of that too. Uh, but we kind of see the overall process. So there's a way for them to feed in material into the kiln because it operates continuously. They have a way then to remove the biochar and actually a bunch of uh, equipment here for capturing the pyrolysis gases and generating heat from those. So in this case, if they're heating water. So it, it's a little bit complicated, the overall system, but the, the rotary hearth itself is also kind of complicated, but I think uh, it's, yeah, it's got a lot of promise. And in this case, it's, you know, relatively expensive design, but um, there may be ways to kind of uh, simplify it and make it a little bit cheaper. So. It's steel construction. It's in this case, it's really high quality steel. So that, that brings the cost up a lot. It has controls. So the removal of the char and the addition of the feedstock are all kind of automated with screws that are on a motor and a controller. Uh, so you can see like, you know, this screw is feeding up to a hopper and then into a bag. So the speed of the motor can change based on the amount of char that's being generated. Um, so I think that whole control side is a little, a little complicated. It kind of automates things and makes it probably a little more efficient and less labor required, but um, there may be ways to simplify that by making it more manual. So it, it, I know this is very flexible on feedstock. It can run on, um, large but not huge actually it, uh, it would be a little difficult to use this with uh, large pieces like wood charcoal um, it's a little bit better designed for uh, smaller biomass it's high cost and part of that is due to the above right the steel using stainless steel a little bit complicated geometry and the electronic controls so this system that we're going to show, it's called the PyroCal Continuous Carbonization Technology. It used to be called Big Char. So they've been around for a little while, um, mostly doing installations, I think, in Australia. Um, but now I think, you know, targeting more of the briquette producers uh, in other countries. Okay, so 
I'm going to try to, so I, I, I'm actually, I don't have direct experience with this one either. So I'm kind of interpreting it the best I can, but I might, I'm obviously missing some pieces. The important thing is there's the feedstock inlet and the, there's actually inlets for air. I don't believe it's really properly labeled here, but feedstock is fed in the top. So the raw biomass comes in the top. And the reason it's called a rotary hearth is that it has these a shaft and then rotating sort of rakes or tines at multiple locations. So there's actually a rotation inside there and there's multiple hearths. And if you're not familiar with the term hearth, it's basically a, a space uh, designed for high temperature combustion or pyrolysis. Just you could think of it kind of like, you know, your firebox or your kiln, the interior of it. So the purpose of these rakes is basically to push the biomass around, right? We want eventually the biomass should flow downwards. So as it carbonizes, finally it reaches the bottom as char. So it kind of cascades through these multiple levels. And at the same time, so it's falling through a grate, the rake sort of pushes it, rotating the biomass so that it comes down, down. Um, so again, this shaft is, you know, that's on a motor in the pyrocal design. Uh, I think down, mounted down here at the bottom. And the ceiling of that shaft is, is a little bit complicated from what I can tell. Um, but the, the other piece here is that there's an actual air, places for the air to enter um, in a very small amount. So that actually within the hearth, the gas produced is, is combusting. So like if you look at some of the photos and videos that they have, uh, there's definitely flame inside there. So this is called direct heat transfer or direct transfer of heat to the biomass, right? Um, whereas kind of the atom retort is a little bit indirect. You're kind of heating the firebox and the brick. This is actually producing a flame right in the, um, uh, right in, that's in contact with the feedstock. And that's the most efficient way to heat up the feedstock. If there's any barrier, like a metal plate or you know, a brick wall, then there's gonna be less efficient heat. So the more we can have direct transfer of heat from the flame back into the biomass, uh, the better. Uh, so the biomass sort of cascades down, interacting with a little bit of air. Um, in the pyrocal design, it appears that they really well, they have very nice control over the air. So the air, it wants to react and, and interact with and react to form a flame. It wants to do that with the gas first. That's the easiest um, molecular, like on a molecular basis, uh, the, the, the compounds in the gases are much easier to react with than the char or the biomass. So if we meter in just a little bit of air, that air will sort of target the gases first, and then any extra air will then target your char, um, which then leads to you know less um, char production, higher ash content. So that's the idea here, and then you'd have you know some exit for you know additional gases and all of that heat coming from the flame which could then be captured. So like in their process, you know, biomass is coming in through this, I think, and then all the heat generated is exiting and being used for something else. Um, and I think we don't see the char removal from the bottom in this picture. So I think it's an interesting design. I think, yeah, it, it's the thing that's great about it is it runs continuously, right? So once you get it fired up, just continue feeding uh, biomass into it and removing char at the same time. And I think that would be really helpful for some of our producers. Um, I think there's other continuous designs that really haven't been documented well, or they're st still kind of uh, being designed and developed and tested. 
Um, and unfortunately, yeah, I just, we don't have enough information on some of the other ones, but, um, I think as, as we go forward, I will kind of keep my eyes open for other examples and I'll do, yeah, I'll share those with our group as much as possible. Um, things that are relevant to our group. So here's a few resources. I, I found the Energypedia site to be really helpful. Uh, kind of in general, but not giving a lot of detail. Um, the report from the ashes conference has some of these, um, designs covered in more detail actually, and a few others as well. So that could be a useful thing to look at. And then there's actually a really nice, um, sort of manual for using, uh, one version of the atom retort. I think it's not sort of the most basic one, but it is documented online. So I, I put a link to that uh, PDF here. And I found it, you know, very detailed step-by-step -step how to actually use that retort. So I'm gonna stop there and thank you so much. And I'm happy to discuss a little bit or take some questions or 